tonight. The main event, we have Marika Kluski from User Testing. She's the Director of User Research. So she's going to talk to us about how to um, innovate with rapid prototyping and user testing. She recently joined User Testing. Before that, she was at the Nielsen Norman Group, which is a well-known UX consultancy. And the ironic thing is, as we were talking about, hey, can I see something real toxic? The, the ironic thing is she gave like dozens, probably hundreds of talks there to companies and people, but they sell their talks. So they don't actually videotape them and make them public. It's like a walled garden approach. So is this the first time you're speaking out of being out in public, out of the walled garden? So this is her like coming out public speaker part. We get the innovative cutting edge speakers here first. And then before that, she was actually an information architect uh, for the NFL. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Marika. Thank you, Marika. Great taste in fonts, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I just found out I use the same font. Look a little as the familiar. Book. <laughs> yeah, same book. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. And yes, this is the first time I'm speaking outside of the Nielsen Norman Group. Um, I joined user testing back in September, which um, doesn't feel like that long ago. Doesn't sound like that long ago. Um, but in user testing terms, is like ancient. We're growing so fast and going so fast. Um, and I've hired 22 researchers since starting. Um, that's how fast our team is um, is growing. Um, one of the researchers is sitting here. We can ask him questions about what it's like. Um, so, um, user, I'll tell you a little bit more about what user testing does as I sort of share a case study that I did about um, uh, where I did some rapid prototyping and made some some quick changes. Um, why I love user testing, and one of the main reasons I joined is that it makes getting feedback from users and input from users so quick, just gives you access to real people who are using your products, um, uh, which is just really exciting. It opens up doors to a lot of opportunities. And actually, the case study I have is something that we're like internally struggling with, how, how to present what's even possible within user testing, kind of broadening the scope. Um, I also have to talk to Dan about his list of jobs and who's represented here because I definitely self-identify as a researcher. I don't know if there's other researchers in the room. There were. I took it off because we filled our position. Uh, yeah. No, in the, oh, the oh, poll. Sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I know sometimes though design, I definitely, when I talk about design and I might say design today, um, I definitely also include research in that. Um, and so I definitely the broadest sense of design, not just the visual designers. Um, and so it's okay if you meant that. That's but, what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so hopefully today's uh, talk will give you some kind of tips and tricks and ways of thinking about doing user research. Um, I'm going to totally use UX research and user research and usability testing all interchangeably. I'm happy to talk to you about the like small nuances between them, but really I'm talking about getting like user feedback um, and understanding who your customers are, who your users are, um, because um, of course. <laughs> okay, so this is a review for a meal planning app, and it's things like this that make me really, really sad, and make me, is sort of the main reason I got into UX, why I care about creating great experiences. Um, it's a great idea, this meal planning app, but um, this person um, uh, is dairy-free, there's no dairy-free plan, this means I still have to invest some time in meal planning to make it work, defeating the purpose for me. And then this, the second, the shopping list would be way better. Similar ingredients would add themselves together. Or if I could reorder items, drag and drop. And so it's missing some of the key things that users want from their meal planning app. What I would love to see is more reviews like this. A ton of functionality. This is so great. It does everything I want to do and more. And I don't even use all the functionality, but I know that it's there. Um, really easy to get into. Um, if you're like me and just want to say, what you're having and when, you can do that too. There's a simple interface for choosing, this is what I, I love, brekkie, <laughs> lunch, etc. for each day. Um, and you can skip some or add or replace and click, and it keeps a list of the meal titles and frequency you eat them. Great bit of easy tracking, thanks to the creator. And don't we all want to hear that? Like, thanks to the creator, thank you for giving me what you gave me here. So I kind of structured today's talk, and I have to apologize. At the Nielsen Norman Group, I give like full day talks, and so I might be like, talking a lot. Um, uh, I like the one hour and I'll stay with the next. I am definitely going to leave some time at the end of um, uh, the end of the session for questions. But if you 
if something really doesn't make sense and you have sort of a pressing question, um, feel free to stop me and I'll answer it now, but I'll make sure that we have time to answer any questions that you, that you might have. Um, I kind of structured the talk around this slide that kind of goes through different phases of a product, um, sort of product life cycle, different phases that you might be in. So research, uh, research and planning, design, um, prototyping, and I know they kind of blend. I'm not saying that it has to be sort of sectioned off. And then development, staging, um, release, and then maintenance and optimization once something is live. Um, I'm going to mostly focus on the top row, which is kind of the whole point of getting sort of feedback early and often. Um, and um, sort of in the discovery phase, when you're kind of getting into it, right, you can get um, answer questions like, who are your users? And then you move on to kind of just making sure you're on the right track um, to how can we improve, which is sort of at the end. And I really want to focus on those first two questions, like, who are our users? Are we on the right track? This is my favorite example ever, and I apologize if you've seen it. If you haven't, now you know that this exists. <laughs> Um, if you think about a restaurant website, there's a couple basic things that you want and need, right? You want to know where the restaurant is, what the menu is, probably price. For me, I really just want to know like where it is and opening times. There's some really basic elements of what you want and need from a re restaurant website. This is what you end up getting from a restaurant website, which is the menu is only downloadable. <laughs> as a 10 megabyte PDF file. Um, can't copy paste anything because it's in Flash. This is my biggest pet peeve about restaurant websites. Just want to copy paste the address, like just let me find it, or a link to Google Maps, but just let me copy paste. Um, obnoxious Flash animation, um, letter from the founder that no one has ever or will ever read. <laughs> and then every restaurant owner thinks they're the first person to use the papyrus font. <laughs> So what we need to do is get into our user's head. We need to understand what it is that they want, what it is that they need, what they're looking for. We need to figure this stuff out before we build something so that we're not wasting a ton of time and resources building something that um, doesn't work. So if we um, solve the wrong problem, it really doesn't matter how well we've solved it because it's not what um, our users or customers are looking for. And I have two examples of kind of getting into users' heads, sort of in the, like, discovery phase, just kind of understanding maybe how a product is currently used, what's working, not working, what people want, so maybe at a stage where you're kind of looking for improvement or just generally trying to find out how people use something. And so um, we did a study on the Fitbit, the Fitbit One, um, where um, users of the Fitbit kind of looked at what, what was working for them, what wasn't as they were holding it, and so I just want to share um, a little clip from that. So, with calories burned, I'm a little skeptical how, I, I, I guess I just don't understand how it knows how many calories I've burned. Um, so that's, I don't know how I, I can't quantify, I mean it is quantified for me, but it's hard for me to know that that's accurate. So, um, while I guess it's good to know that it, it thinks it's right, I just don't, I don't fully trust that the calories are correctly calculated. Um, the flower activity meter, I think this is probably the least useful as sorry. Probably the least useful feature uh, of this Fitbit, just because um, it's hard for me to know what that means in terms of the, the size of the flower. Um, I, I guess it means that I've got a lot of uh, I'm currently you know moderately active, but. I don't know, it just doesn't, the flower doesn't do anything for me. Sorry, I'm trying to get this to click. <laughs> so, it's not that doing this kind of research is going to automatically solve your problems and come up with a great new design, but it gives you some insight into how people are thinking about the product and how they're responding to it. Now, if you got this feedback much earlier on before the product went live and was done and was built, um, you can try to make changes and kind of think about, okay, so maybe our idea of what this was going to mean is different than what people want, or maybe they need additional information to understand what's going on here. Um, the other one, totally different um, situation. Um, I recently, um, 
I wanted to show that you could use user testing to test email campaigns and email newsletters and, and also see that as an interface. Um, and so I set up a sample inbox and just signed up for a ton of newsletters ranging from like a ton of different topics. Um, and then I sent a bunch of participants to this inbox and had them kind of look through it. And I really just wanted a better understanding of what people do when they're looking through an inbox. And I know that it's not the truest situation. I know it's not the newsletters they signed up for, and so it felt more spammy because they didn't know where it was coming from. But it still gave me really, really valuable insight into kind of the mindset of users. What is it that they're thinking? What's kind of going through their mind as they're looking at an inbox? So I'm going to share a little clip from that too. Because I've always been interested in learning another language, so 60% off actually sounds really good. I'd be really interested in that. I mean, like it. <laughs> 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 yeah. James Clear, Albert Einstein's corporate work ethic lessons on creativity and contribution. Now it's funny because. I'm choosing it based on the center, and then from the center, I'm going to the subject. Depending on the subject, that sounds interesting. I'm looking to see if the content is interesting. Like, uh, I'm around to James Clear and have it seminars happening this week or recording. Huh. So he hadn't actually even heard of James Clear, who is mostly just a blogger and hadn't signed up for it, but the the subject line of the email really sparked his interest and was a topic that he was interested in. And of course, this is where it becomes kind of random. And I actually ended up asking the participants to share a little bit about what they are interested in and to sort of talk about why they're opening certain emails and why not others to kind of get a sense of that. Um, and so these are both examples of, of research that you can do kind of still in a discovery phase. Or, I mean, for the Fitbit, you could do it after it's launched, right? Kind of. Um, maybe think about the next iteration of it, but it's really just kind of getting a better understanding of how people are using your product, what are they using, what else are they using. Um, and I, uh, there was another component to the email marketing campaign that I'll share later. I actually showed two different versions of an email, so I actually created like a prototype within the email um, that I'll, um, I'll tell you guys about as well. So the same project life cycle, the different stages, um, this is how it can feel as a UX researcher or as someone on the team trying to advocate for doing research and specifically in this situation doing usability testing. Like, Does this make sense for the people that are going to be using it? Do they know where to go? Do they understand the functionality? Does the content make sense to them? Are they getting what we wanted them to get from it? So thinking of maybe the flower on the Fitbit, Fitbit does that make sense to users? Um, this is how it can feel. Like, let me in. I just want to do UX research. Like, make space, make room for me. Um, this isn't bad to do it at this stage once things are live and have been developed, especially if you are kind of building things incrementally. It can be really, really nice to do a larger study, um, kind of making sure everything ties together and everything fits together. Um, but what I want you, what I want to encourage all of you to do or think about is being UX superheroes. So in the earlier stages where I can answer so many really, really interesting questions before something has actually been built or before a lot of development time has got into it, even before a lot of design time has got into it. I'm definitely not a visual designer, and you'll see some of my wireframes, both sketches and a little bit higher fidelity <laughs> wireframes. Um, and I definitely need to work with a visual designer to get the design to look good enough to send to people. Um, but there's a lot you can do just as anyone that's not a visual designer to get feedback from users. Um, and so I want to empower you guys to be UX superheroes with this. Um, so 
it really comes down to, at this stage, just a lot of idea generation and then validating those ideas. So coming up with a ton of different concepts, a ton of different ideas for solving a problem. So maybe you, um, I guess one of the things that you'd actually do in the discovery phase is kind of try to figure out what is it that people need, um, what's working about our current system or not working, or if you're designing a completely new thing, like maybe it's a new running app, um, I definitely encourage you to test other running apps. Like, how are people using the current running apps that are out there? If it's enterprise software that's trying to solve a problem for people at work, what are they using now, and what's working for them, what's not working, and especially the things that they, like the workarounds that they're using. Like, what are, when are they switching to some other program, or when are they going online, because the tool that they're supposed to be using doesn't do everything that they needed to do. And once you've kind of answered those questions about what it is that people need, what it is that they're, um, what is that they're using, what what, um, what problem are you trying to solve, then you can kind of delve into does my idea meet that need? What is my idea, and are we on the right track? Um, and that's kind of the sort of remaining focus of the talk that I want to um, kind of like hone in on is how to do that, how to validate that quickly, how to come up with lots of ideas. Um, and this is where the sketching workbook that I decided to pair with this talk will come in really handy because it kind of frees up a lot of that like, oh, but I need it to look a certain way. It's like just get some stuff on paper and just start talking to colleagues about what your idea is. It can really help to visualize um, those concepts. Um, we recently did a project for a client um, uh, and they have a news app and they it was still sort of in the concept phase, slightly higher fidelity, um, and they decided to have their um, engineer and the designer and the UX researcher um, watch the sessions live. So we did moderated testing for them, and they really wanted to know if a new um, read later feature was going to work. Like, I want to sort of save this article to read later. They already had a favorites kind of feature, um, and they wanted to just know, does this work? Does the usability work for this thing? Um, and what they found was that the need for this feature wasn't there, that people were using their favorites as a read later. Um, and so it was a really, really hard lesson to learn, but they hadn't spent any time developing it yet or coding it yet. Um, they actually, in the two days of testing that they did with us, were able to go home and the engineer made some small tweaks, some minor changes, so they could get feedback on it, um, on sort of the newer version of that. But really what they ended up deciding at the end of the two day study was that they were just going to go back to the drawing board and realize that they really didn't have a good grasp on what people needed and needed to kind of rethink what problem they were trying to solve, which, again, can be really, really hard to hear. <laughs> it can be really devastating, but so much better than once it's launched and you realize that people aren't using it and you wasted all this time. Um, so I just briefly want to talk about mental models because it's Super, super important when it comes to understanding your customers and thinking about the design. Um, so, and I love this example for doing that. If, imagine the woman on the left is the designer um, and the man on the right is the user. Um, imagine trying to describe in your design an iceberg and you know that you're talking about an iceberg. You keep talking about ice and it's cold and it's wet and the user thinks you're talking about ice cubes. They're gonna be really, really confused. And now a common misunderstanding is that it's the user's fault. We'll just have to tell them or teach them or train them or they'll figure it out on their own. Like they'll learn what it is. And really it's on us as designers on the team building the product to say, no, listen, I'll give you all the clues you need, everything you need to know so that you know that I'm talking about an iceberg, so that we're on the same page, so that you don't think this is supposed to do something that it doesn't do or that you're looking for a feature because you didn't understand that we had it hidden in some menu somewhere or that we called it something else that wasn't familiar to you. And this is where Lean UX, really the tenets of Lean UX come in and why rapid prototyping fits in really nicely with Lean UX. And so um, if you sort of practice Lean UX or hear about Lean UX or sort of intrigued by it, it really comes down to um, thinking, making, and checking. So I'm gonna do the idea generation, come up with lots and lots of ideas um, make something that I can get validated, and then check that. So do the validating with customers. It can also, at some point, you might start with just your team members, and so creating some sketches can be really helpful in just getting feedback from your colleagues. Um, but it's about getting input from customers quickly and lots of time. So kind of keep doing this until you feel really good about it. 
right? And this is where the rapid starts coming in. So keep thinking and making and checking until you feel really, really good. Um, and then we can get to the like super high fidelity or the almost final product that's about to launch that you want to sort of get a final sense of if it works or doesn't. Um, but continuously sort of refining your, your prototype um, and your idea uh, can really, really help out your final design. So super basic. So just in case people don't know what usability testing is, or so the basic premise of usability testing is that you sit with a participant, someone who represents your target audience, so ideally someone who would actually use what it is you're doing. I did a study once on an auto insurance website, and we thought we had recruited the right people who made auto insurance decisions in their household. And this really nice lady sits down, and we give her the first task, and she's like, I don't do, like, I don't ever do this. My husband's the one that makes decisions about this. He's the one that has got our car insurance. I, I'm not, I have no idea what this is and how to make any decisions about this. And so seeing how she uses the system, actually super interesting. We still did it, but we didn't use that data to make the same decisions and compare her results to anyone else. But back to the premise of usability testing, you find people who represent your target audience and you give them a design to look at, or you give them something to work with, and you ask them to attempt tasks, attempt, ask them to attempt activities that you're, um, I like to think about sort of the top three to five things that you must be able to do in your app or website or product. What are the top things that are really, really important to you? And make sure that people can do that. Now when it's not a final design or final product, um, not everything is going to be interactive, not everything, they're not going to be able to do all these activities. And maybe you also break it up and do one activity first and then the next round or next time another activity. You can also ask them, and this is what's cool about testing prototypes, ask them what they think would happen if they were to click something or if it were clickable or what they think would happen if they clicked on a button or a link label. And that actually gives you a lot of information about their mental model. Right? So if we go back to this example, if we were to ask someone about sort of what do you expect to happen if you click on this or in your own words describe what we offer and he starts talking about ice cubes in a glass, then we know that there's a mismatch even if the final thing isn't interactive or doesn't look beautiful. So that's my favorite question to ask about um, like non-fully non interactive <laughs> designs that you're testing. Um, and then what to test. I mentioned the sort of top five, three to five most important things that, pe that people must be able to do on your, um, on your app or site. Um, think about really basic flows. Like prototypes are not the place to get into super <coughs> details on everything, um, but large concepts. Like do they understand the major functionality? Can they find it? Can they go through a flow if that's an important process for you? Um, and do they know what the options are, like the breadth of what you offer? Um, really important also um, if you're designing a website, what you offer on the website, who you are, what you do, that's something that's really easy to test in a prototype. You don't need a final design to see if someone can describe in their own words what it is that you offer. So this is where we get to the um, case study that I decided to run for this talk because it's something I've been thinking about a lot at user testing. So. Um, when Dan even was explaining sort of what user testing does, it's the fastest and easiest way to get um, feedback on your website or app. Now, here's the problem. We actually do so much more at user testing, and this page is outdated, and we're stuck. We're stuck on what this should be, because there's so many ways to think and talk about the research that we can do. The Fitbit one is an example. Like, what is that? <laughs> and how do we describe it? And so. Um, I happen to be talking about this problem, um, and this isn't even really my job. I manage our team of UX consultants that help our enterprise clients. We have a separate product team that's designing this, but as a UX researcher, I can't help but get involved and butt in and <laughs> share my opinion. I happen to be talking to one of our client success managers about this page, and he's like, oh, do you mind if I give it a shot? Like, I want to try something too. And so he sent me a design, and then one of his colleagues also sent me a design. She's been really, she's been getting really into prototyping and sketching, kind of honing those skills. And um, maybe not surprisingly, they came up with a very, very similar idea and design, and mine was totally different. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to walk you through the uh, the designs and sketches and ideas that we came up with, and then also the feedback that we got. So I'll share more video clips. Um, 
And then after that, I'll talk about kind of like the day and what your day might look like and tools and how to like do this and why user testing is a really awesome tool. So I'm going to get a little meta on you because I use user testing to test user testing. Um, <laughs> which also means that you have to recruit UX professionals, which adds its whole own le like another level of complexity. And the feedback you get from UX professionals in a usability study is really, really entertaining. Um, <laughs> But as a UX professional, I know I'm usually like, not qualified to take tests, and so it can be really, really fun to finally be able to take a test and, and share your opinion and your feedback. Um, so this is the current version. This was the one my colleague Vinny came up with. Um, he is really, really into um, games and game testing and working with also software clients. So he has a lot of our software and gaming clients and trying to help them understand how they can take advantage of remote, remote unmoderated research. And so when I was explaining the basic premise of usability testing, kind of implied that you're sort of with the participant and what user testing does is allow you to reach those people anywhere in the world. And so you don't have to be in the same room with them, which is the remote component. And then we also send them a study to do on their own in their own time. And so we're not there to ask for, for follow-up questions, um, but we're able to reach a lot more people a lot quicker with that. So he wanted to make sure that people knew that they could test software in games. And so he basically added another component to, um, to that screen and then also said, people don't really know what we mean when we talk about this stuff, so I'm going to add an example video. Um, and one of the items of feedback that we got on that was, that's really helpful, especially for people new to user testing. So I was like, oh, that's such a great idea. Actually, and by the way, none of this is clickable. So this is actually just a static image. Um, you can click, and I, in one of the videos that you'll see, you'll see someone kind of click through. They could click through all the steps to get to this page. So if you're in the user testing, um, like in your dashboard, once you've logged into your account, you can create a new test, and then this is what you see when you create a new study. Um, some other feedback that we got. This is a little broad. I'd want to be able to learn more. Um, yeah, and this is the one we struggle with a lot, like testing experience, like what, I mean, this is, what we mean by this is kind of like anything out there in the world. <laughs> um, like test how your product works, like your Fitbit, test um, the ordering a coffee at Starbucks process. Like is that, what are these things called and do we split them up or not? Um, so it's like this is a little broad. Um, did help to see in home, outside, or at a specified location. Like provides a little bit of context but still not really enough to know what, what you could do here. Um, and I love this one. I don't know if I'd use the word configure. It doesn't sound consumer friendly. This is the kind of feedback you get from UX professionals. She went into talking about how it's like a developer word, and it's like not so she would probably use create. And it's like, yeah, that's cool. I mean, she's right. <laughs> configure is probably not the, the, best, um, uh, the best word to use. So let me show you a video of someone on this. Hi, everyone. My name is so, pass. Um, for today's section, you will be using the account on the site projects at usertesting.com. The PW has been in, uh, not, sorry, actually. Sorry, did not want to make you listen to a 20 minute video. <laughs> um, but this is all part of the prototype. Um, let's see if this or is if you want to click something new, it's either the button is either here or it's here. Um, I used a um, Surrey Monkey um, before in the top left. If the I get to test it. Open in the same tab. Okay. You will get feedback in about an hour. Test the website, test the app, software, game, test the experience, images. Oh, okay. Okay, I see what these pages are. Mm. So, okay, so basically this is the first step. Uh, where you will choose whether you want to test on the web, you test the website on your desk, um, you know, desktop, smartphones, or tablet. Oh, I originally saw that this is test the website means test something on desktop. Test app software or game means test something on your tablets or mobile phones. Um, test experience, I'm not quite sure what that means, so I go down to read this small test. 
uh, you know, underneath the picture, and I realized it's more like contextual inquiry. And and that's the part of that that I wanted you guys to hear. She actually does figure it out. I mean, it really is kind of like a contextual inquiry. It's kind of understanding how people are using something in their natural environment. So that actually it made me happy to see that that worked, and she made the right connection. She was a little confused about that. But her initial impression of, oh, test a website, test an app, she, the like, assumption that it was desktop and mobile is something that we definitely need to work on and think about. Like, how do we make it really clear that it's not either, it, we're not restricted to testing websites on desktop and apps on a phone. And another thing, no one mentioned this. And maybe because I didn't ask them to think about these situations and they weren't in, so I did kind of both there. I asked participants to think about a situation that they were running a study on on their own, but then I also gave them a situation to try to set up that study. Um, what if you're testing a prototype and then what if you're doing something multi-channel that kind of spans both uh, like desktop, but it spans maybe desktop and a smartphone and a tablet? Or what if you're doing like an in-store experience where you want to see if someone uses like from their phone to picking up a product in a store, like there's all these really cool things that we can do that aren't represented here. Um, this was my idea, totally different. But I was like, how about we just give everyone all the options up front and see what happens? Like, are we going to completely overwhelm them, or are we going to say, hey, here are the things that you can do in user testing? Um, this was the big thing that people didn't understand was participant location because. Yes, that's a demographics criteria, like do I want people in San Francisco, do I want people in New York, in the UK? Um, so where, where are they based and where are they from? Or where do I want them to be during the study? Um, and I'll show you two new versions of this. And that's what I was going for was where do I want them to be in the study? And I, I just wasn't think I was thinking about my iceberg and just assumed that people would know that. <laughs> and yet they were thinking about their ice cubes. Um, and so they immediately went, oh, I, well, I'd want people, like, I don't really care they can be anywhere, or no, I actually really need them to be in a certain place. Um, this got three people. I can choose more than one. So that kind of solves our multi-channel problem. I was like, okay, the checkboxes mean I can test on multiple devices. The checkboxes above also mean I can test multiple um, things. <laughs> um, one participant commented though, like, I don't know what that, was really confused about that even being possible, so we probably have to do something about how, what does that, like, really, that's possible, like, what does that look like? Um, and then the name, what are you testing, that's really simple and to the point, there's really no better way of explaining that. That's nice to hear, that's good. But, this is the big one, and something I, I know we'll have to think about if we kind of go this route. Um, it's all kind of jumbled on one page, but it's probably faster. So someone did think like, well, if it's all there, I can probably make my selection quicker, but it's kind of all over the place. And then someone else commented on my lack of design skills and uh, <laughs> was really frustrated that the icons don't line up on the back. <laughs> like, but it's a prototype. Um, <laughs> it's like, I'm just trying to get the idea across. Um, but that does happen. Um, so this was that very first version and my new iteration on it. Um, as you can see, the first two, like we had done it on the computer, i share a little bit how, how I did that, but then um, Vinny had done that first one and I actually didn't have his design and I probably could have like copy pasted and created new versions of his. I was like, why don't I just like sketch out what I'm trying to think of and have sort of the multiple options in there. Um, so not sure what this is, <laughs> is what someone said. We get back to that experience one. Um, I'd love to see what step I'm in. I have no idea how many steps it's going to be. And that would be really cool, was like, oh, multiple touch points, like, I can do that. And the example I gave is from desktop website to in-store. It's like, oh, that's so awesome. That's an option. That's something I can do. Now, I'm a little afraid that my next video is also going to be 20 minutes, and it didn't take my little clip. Let's see. I'm going to try. No, it worked. Yes. OK. So this is someone. So this is using the user testing tool and getting feedback just on a sketch. Again, just a static image. What problem do you end up testing? I don't know what I test. I test a prototype, and I click on this, and use that to show off a new user interface, which I've been trying to program. And that would allow me to get the best experience from my users. 
So she totally got what a prototype was and, and could relate that to her situation and know what she was trying to test and knew that that was the best one for her. Here's my second one, and I really want to focus on the um, what I changed to step three. So it was participant location, and I changed it to particip participant environment during study. And this is where like rapid prototyping is so amazing. It's like I was able to make that change in like two seconds, and maybe like an extra ten seconds of thinking about an alternative. And maybe sometimes you need ten minutes or thirty minutes to think of the alternative. But it was really quick to come up with that other thing. Um, Super, I mean, great feedback. She completely understood what I was saying and then was like, really? Like, at home for sure, but will people be willing to take a test at work? I really don't know. And this like, oh, like she completely knew that what I was trying to say is people can take their test at work. Well, if you're designing enterprise software, like, yeah, you'd love for people to take the test at work. And we do have people that do. And sometimes it requires a little bit of um, specific recruiting or making sure the timing works out, but it's definitely a possibility. Um, and then this is, um, oh, there's another better one. Um, can you explain this? Is there extra cost involved? I would want to know if I'm going to be paying more. This is testing over time, so doing multiple sessions with participants versus, so like a diary study. Um, again, this participant totally got what we were saying and, and had already gone to that next step. So to me, that's an indicator that it's clear what we're saying, and they're already thinking about the next thing. And this is great for idea generation, like, oh, you, you know, we should probably mention something about that, because, yeah, it does actually cost more. It costs a lot more. Um, and so maybe we should say something about that. This one I love. Um, I clearly wasn't really thinking about the icons I was using. <laughs> do we really want people doing tests while they're driving on their driving or on their bike? That seems a little dangerous. <laughs> um, and actually, when our uh, new mobile recorder came out a couple months ago, we um, uh, had a like market. We created a marketing video to kind of show all the possibilities. And there is actually a situation where it's like someone testing out like a, a sports app. To, uh, while they're biking, and so you see the guy like stopping his bike and getting off his bike and answering questions about the bike ride. And so, like, yeah, it's possible, but yeah, maybe not while they're actually biking. <laughs> um, but I mean, people come up with crazy cool ideas. And actually, um, what I really like at user testing is that we we do research for our clients, but our clients are also doing research on their own and by themselves. And it's so cool to hear what people are coming up with and how they're figuring out ways to use basically our like panel and software to record people doing anything anywhere um really really cool ideas um and so i actually um do I have a video with this one yeah i do oh no it's also the whole video let me see if i can quickly get it very easy because um, when uh, we know this, but do we really want people doing tests on the go when they're driving or on their bike? I don't know about that. That seems a little dangerous. Um, Actually, her reaction is really interesting when she first gets this, to this page. Let me show you that. At home, for sure. So it's not Target. And then I um, completely go back and re- without actually clicking it yet. So in test six, I actually ask her what she expects to happen when she clicks and create a new test before she clicks it. Uh, I would expect to be taken to a screen where I can upload um, the designs I want to test, and I can start putting the questions together if I hit that create a new test button. Okay, so I'm going to create a new test. Okay, actually, I like this better than what I was expecting to see. Okay. And even insight like that is, like, great. She had sort of a, her mental model. We kind of understood her mental model of what her flow, her expected flow was. And then also heard, like, oh, okay, this is not a, like, oh, why do I have to make these decisions now? I really wanted to make other decisions. But, oh, it's actually really helpful to have to make these decisions at this point in time. So I hear a lot of um, misconceptions about testing prototypes or static images or um, anything that's not done, that people won't provide feedback. I showed you that people are happy to provide feedback. Um, yes, sometimes participants get a little hung up on the visual design, but 
another thing happens too where they realize that it's not done and so they're actually more than happy to provide that feedback. You say, this is, we're still figuring out the design. I'm happy to show you what the like instruction text was. I actually think it's in, um, it's in one of the slides coming up, like what I gave people as instructions and saying we're redesigning this page for user testing. We're still testing out a couple ideas. This is not the final design. And people actually get, like, it, it feels good to give feedback because they know they're not hurting anyone's feelings. They're not upsetting anyone. Um, and so it kind of, like, um, it makes people more comfortable providing feedback. Um, so people definitely will provide feedback. And it does not have to be the final visual design. You can get a lot of insight into do people understand the language? Do people know where to go, what the next step is? Um, and it also doesn't have to be interactive, as I should. So part of my prototype was interactive to kind of set the stage and get people to the right place. But then it's like, I really only have that first step. I haven't even gone to think about that next step yet. Like, what comes after you've made these decisions? Like, what happens when you create your experience test? And on our end now, we, we don't have the ability to customize it specifically to what the researcher on the other end is trying to do. Whereas if we knew more information about the study that you're trying to create, we can actually give you tailored content and information and say, oh, you want to test a prototype, here's how to do that. Here's the suggested instruction text, and here's suggested tasks. So we can do a lot more to help people through the process as well. And as you saw in my examples, it doesn't have to be a sketch. Now, I definitely encourage you to start sketching. I really like sketching to um, put my ideas on paper to share it with colleagues and team members. Um, but you have to or should use the thing that you're fastest in, whatever you can create change in fastest. And I actually really, really like Snagit, which is just a screen capture software, but their editor is amazing, like for me at least, works really, really well. Um, and I kind of happened to stumble on it, so I was using them for screen capturing, but the copy-paste feature, the blur feature, like everything in it works really well for me, and I actually created all my non-sketch prototypes in Snagit editor. Um, and so whatever works for you, like if you are a pro at Photoshop, if Axure is like, when someone else says, oh, no, not Axure, like don't use Axure, it's too hard. Like that's super easy for you by all means. Like do whatever works quickly for you. Um, I encourage you at some point though, especially if you're working with a team of people, to try out sketching the ideas first or if the, before you, um, if you're just coming up with a whole bunch of ideas and then maybe pick the three you want to test that people agree on or maybe you, sketch out a lot of your ideas and then merge them into sort of like one design that you want to test and iterate on. Um, I added a resource here that I really like on um, like prototyping tools. I figured instead of creating a list that's out there that I really like already, I would just link you to it. And so it has um, some great resources for creating um, prototypes and just sketching. Um, I also really, really like Balsamic. So I kind of go in between like creating stuff in Balsamic, creating stuff in Snagit Editor, and um, Envision app is usually where I'll host my clickable prototypes, which is also what I used here. Um, and I'll show you how I set that up. So I just wanted to kind of like end out with what like the day looks like, or sort of what the process for rapid prototyping is or could be, and the benefit of that. Um, and I specifically called this good. This is a more sort of traditional usability testing process or sort of a more like we have budget for one study per project. We're going to do two days of testing. We're going to do 10 participants. We're going to get all the findings we possibly can, write up a big juicy report, <laughs> 200 pages, and everyone's going to read every word of it, <laughs> which doesn't happen, unfortunately. <laughs> and then um, the little like yellow star <laughs> or call out is when design changes are happen, um, and are made, and I intentionally left it out in one of the rounds of testing where um, in, in this situation, it can be really hard to make design changes, especially if testing happens too late in the process. If you're doing testing on a final website or app right before it launches, like, forget the timeline, like the launch date, but also just like, how are you gonna get engineers to devote their time to redo work that they did, that they spent three months working on, or three weeks working on? One model that's really, really great is to do something like three on Thursday or five on Friday, um, or there's slight variations on this, so you can make up kind of your own, but just have a set schedule for doing testing. Um, and this kind of gets into the like rapid prototype, like the rapid feedback. I'm gonna get feedback every Thursday, whatever's ready, whatever we can test, whatever it might be. So it might be the same product one Thursday and then a new version of it the next, or maybe it's a new product, a new team that you're doing testing for. And so it's kind of like 
whoever wants feedback can, can get that on that day, and then design changes are made. I mean, I put them all on Monday as sort of like, it, it leaves room and time and space to make changes quickly, assuming that what is being tested is early enough in the process. But rapid prototyping, you kind of have rapid prototyping and testing days, where you say, today I'm gonna devote my time to um, testing my design, um, hearing the feedback, making changes, testing it again, and making changes. And I've both done this in person and remotely. Um, and in person, you have to kind of schedule people in certain sessions and then leave extra space. I like starting with two people to kind of get a more balanced view and then leave some time to make changes, have someone else come in, leave some time to make changes, and have a final participant come in. If you can fit in five people in the day, awesome. If you can only fit in three people in the day, that's all better than nothing. Like it really, especially in rapid prototyping, there's not a whole lot to your interface yet. And if you have, it's just an idea and a sketch. So like what you, there's not gonna be that many usability issues to find because there's just not much there. And so it's about sort of big picture conceptually or people getting what it is that you're trying to, to show them or tell them. So I explained as we were going kind of how user testing works. Um, but now that you kind of have seen sort of a day of rapid prototyping and a day of designing, um, so we have the screen recording software, um, and it's the screen recording software on a mobile device then allows you to turn the camera on to then record things elsewhere. Um, you set up a study, can send it to many people at once, they take their test, and then an hour later, give or take some, depending on who you're looking for, <laughs> um, you get the videos back and can watch those videos. Um, and there's a couple extra little things that work really, really well when it comes to doing rapid prototyping. Um, so I mentioned Envision. This is a screenshot of the Envision dashboard. They're a prototype hosting service, or like a screenshot hosting service. You can also use it to collaborate on designs. But one of the really cool things, so these are the four steps of my prototype. If you upload a new image with the exact same name, it'll just replace it. And so you can have your project and just keep naming it the same, like keep naming the new version of what you're testing. So I went back and just changed the old version to V1 and then uploaded the new one as my step four. Um, and then the URL that's linked to, everything stays the same. It knows that it's a new version of that. So it's like, it's built for rapid prototyping, which is really, really nice. And then um, this is just to show you like what the settings Envision can get a little tricky, so I wanted to give you like tips and tricks for how to set the Envision settings. But you get this URL at the bottom that you can then share in something like user testing. So I send people to that URL, gave them instructions like, you're gonna be setting up a usability study, but instead of using our live site, you're just using a concept for it, it's just an idea of it. And so that feature in Envision app where like uploading a new image just gives you the same, like it, it replaces it in User testing, when you create a study, um, and I launch something with two people, I can actually just add more users. And so if the URL stays the same for my prototype, but my prototype looks different, I can add people and it's gonna actually be different, but it makes it really, really quick. I don't have to set the screener up again, I don't have to, even if you like duplicate the study, like you can create a similar test, that's still time consuming. And so this one I just like add two more people. Like I want the same people, same demographics, I'm sorry, not the same participants, but I want the same demographics to just take this test again. And so it's kind of that combination of like, the prototype can live somewhere, I can send this to as many people as I want at any time, that let you do, um, this is what that looks like after, that let you do, that lets you be flexible in your day of prototyping and testing. So you could say like, you know, I'm gonna launch my study at the end of the day, on day one, go home, come back the next day, watch the videos, make some changes. When I'm ready, Hour later, two hours later, 30 minutes later, 15 minutes later, I'm gonna watch it again to more people. Then when those videos come in, so I did add in time to watch videos, so that is something you have to then keep in mind. <laughs> um, but it allows for a lot more flexibility. So um, recruiting UX professionals was a little harder than I wanted it to be, and so I didn't get to do it in this timeline, um, but I got to do it over like three days instead of like a day of, of testing and making changes. And so um, this is a like, downside of a very specific audience, but it, it still gives you the flexibility. You can be doing other stuff while you're testing your prototype. And I just wanted to share one example, also internal example, where we kind of did this, like our day, like where it did work to do kind of our day of 
uh, a rapid prototyping and testing. We have a device lab at user testing, so it's a place where people can come use phones, smartphones, if you're designing a new app and you don't have a, whatever, Samsung Galaxy, um, and you want to test it, you can get that device, check it out, see if it works, on, uh, see if your app or, or site works on those <coughs> devices. Um, when, uh, someone on our marketing team, Steph, created this website and kind of the whole idea behind it, um, and she wrote a really great blog post about that process, and so I um, also referenced the blog post, um, but she outlined her day. <laughs> Um, and so she went from concept and sketching to creating the graphics to setting up her Marketo page. This is her, like the, the landing page that you see here. And then got some feedback from her team, made some tweaks, set up her study, and then um, took, went out for lunch. <laughs> like set up her study, launched it in user testing, went out for lunch, came back, saw the feedback she had, um, reviewed the sessions, um, made some updates based on that feedback, ran three more sessions. It took her one minute to run those three more sessions for the reasons I showed you. Um, reviewed those sessions and made some final updates and then launched. And the whole thing took her six hours and 15 minutes to do in a day, basically by herself with a little bit of help, like feedback help from her team. So I want to challenge you to spend a day rapid prototyping. Um, I have three credits in user testing for you if you don't have an account yet. Unfortunately, it doesn't work if you already have an account. Um, but three credits if you use the code Lean Prod Meetup. Um, you put in the code at the very, very end of the process. So you have to go through the whole process of setting up a test. Email me your feedback on what it's like to set up your test, because we're working on creating a new flow for that. Um, uh, set up your test, and then do run two participants during lunch, watch the videos, run another participant, make some changes, and enjoy the feedback that you get from that. So thank you all very much. Yeah, questions? Yes. Or do you want to do mic? Yeah, we're going to. Okay, sorry. Is Mike here? <laughs> yeah, Mike. got a lot of mics. Who's got one? This karaoke. There's two questions over here. Is this karaoke? Yes. <laughs> You're a bit pitchy, dog. Yeah, so I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is, um, do, you all, do you always get convergence? Or, or do, you, do you see changes for, for sex, for culture, for, for that sort of thing? Or some convergence around some sense of goodness. And my second question is, yeah. do the tests have to be st statistically significant? Because it yeah. sounds to me like three people is yeah. probably not statistically significant. Um, yeah, I'm going to take the second question first. Um, no, like usability testing can be quantitative. You can make it statistically significant if you're doing a benchmark and wanting any comparison. If you want to say um, we're better than this competitor or version A works better or like um, performs better than version B. Um, but most of what you're getting at with usability testing is um, the, the really that mental model that's sort of just the qualitative, like what the, it's really the why behind it. It's sort of Lara Kine's talk from last time. It's, um, why is something an issue? Not how many errors were made, where were the errors made. It's like, does this make sense? And if it doesn't, why? So that you know, like I could have found, if I had done a larger study, found that people didn't know what the participant location was. I'd have to go in and understand why participant location didn't make sense. And I don't need to hear that from a whole lot of people. Like I hear that from, I heard that from two people, that location they thought to be demographics. Like that's enough for me to know, like we probably should rethink that. What I don't do is listen to suggestions from users when I listen to three people. If they say, you should make this blue, I'm like, well, that's just your opinion. You might not like green, and so I won't, I'm not going to listen to you, but it's the, the, their reasoning and thought process. Um, and then the convergence one, you try to balance out your sort of like sample. It can happen that you happen to get three people who kind of think the same way. I mean, one of the reasons to not get the same participants the second time in like the testing the second version is that it's like new new ideas, new thoughts. Um, I don't see it happen where it's like oh, all like these people think this one thing and sort of agree. It, it can happen. Let's say that, yeah. And I would probably put it on sort of like your screening criteria, like who you're looking for, making sure um, if. I don't know, female population is your target audience or like the majority of it, you can run one study with them or if it's like women in London or something and then run also studies with new users or if you're trying to break through a new market, making sure you're getting the feedback and input from a wide range. For like rapid prototyping and feedback on this, I would go with sort of like your largest audience. Like don't worry about having to do this with 
both new customers and existing customers, I would go with sort of like, what is the top priority? Like if new customers is the top priority this year for you, then test that with new people. Yeah. There was another question here. Yeah. So we talk a lot about uh, website and mobile app testing. What about enterprise yeah. software testing? Yeah. In your experience, any best practices and differences? Um, yeah, for sure. And one of the reasons that we need to change that page, right, for like telling people that this is a thing and possible. Um, I visited one of our enterprise software clients, and they like even they felt that way. And this partly is just the way we've done marketing. So in general, problems with enterprise software is like security is getting people to take a test at work. Um, We've tried some workarounds where, like, I mean, we have participants sign NDAs no matter what. We can have them sign another NDA. We can have them sign your NDA. Um, you can, instead of having them, you can do a moderated session where you share your screen versus having them share their screen. So they're looking at a thing that you, like, they don't actually get the product to try out. Um, that doesn't stop any of them taking screenshots or photos. And even if you hear someone take a screenshot, you don't know if they're taking a photo. Like, I mean, these are worst case scenarios. This really doesn't happen that often. Um, but it can happen. And I mean, there's definitely a point in time where like, if you're testing a new, like for gaming clients, like your next coolest game, like maybe is not a great unmoderated remote solution. And maybe you bring people into the lab and you like take their phone from them so that they're not going to share what they see. Um, but generally, though, testing enterprise software, I mean, you can get people to test it at home after they're at work, talk to like some of your loyal customers to see if they have people at their company who are willing to do some testing for you. And then, um, I mean, I've done things like not pay people because they're doing it at work and they're getting paid to be at work if you work out something with a company. Um, but it's definitely possible to do the same, all the same, like contextual inquiry, like usability testing, like all the same studies that you might do. Uh, thanks a lot for a great presentation. And, uh, you might have uh, already told about it. Yeah. Uh, do you also provide uh, uh, users, or it, does, do I have to bring my own users? Uh, you can do both. Um, we have a panel of participants. That's what makes it fast. That's the like one hour that you like getting results back in an hour is because we have a panel of people. Um, if you have a certain really specific audience, you can use your own um, participants for that. Um, we have to sort of get them in our platform, and they need the rec like the desktop recorder or the mobile recorder to kind of get set up. Um, uh, but it's possible, yeah. And then, can you also give like a rough idea of the pricing? So let's say if I have, I need ten users. Yeah. But approximately, how much would it cost? Maybe we'll have Jared talk about this after. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna push this off on Jared when he does the the raffle. Um, I, I don't even know where to start. So we have like uh, sort of like individual plans, but then also enterprise plans. So it really depends on what you're like. Are I mean, most of the clients I work with are on a subscription plan for the year, so they have like annual credits to use, annual. Um, uh, research hours to interact with the research team. And it's on our website. If you talk to me, whoever. Okay, talk to Jared. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to let you decide. Um, do you um, assist in finding uh, users if you're uh, if you need something in a very specific niche, like, I don't know, petroleum engineers or something like that, yeah. uh, does user testing assist in getting those types of users? Yeah, we'll do our best. Yeah, I'm always like blown away by the people we can find. Um, even in our panel, I'm always like really, really impressed with the people that we uh, we seem to recruit for. Um, when it's super special, like even just UX professionals, I ended up asking my first question. I did. I had a screener, but the first question was, "Tell me about your role and your experience doing usability testing." And I heard them talk about it, and that's like a really great way to make sure that they actually know what they're talking about, that they're actually UX professionals. Um, but we also we have actually a whole team that manages our panel that also help with recruiting and scheduling and everything that sort of comes with that. And they'll they're incredible. Like I can't take any credit for the work that they do, but they'll find you those people. Yeah, my favorite example to use is like people that have bought a size nine shoe in Rome in the last week. And it's like <laughs> yeah, we'll find that of course. <laughs> like no problem. <laughs> you can put in like segmentation screener stuff right? and then screener questions, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, the point is like you can in the tool put in your like demographics criteria, um, but it um, and actually you can write your own screener. Right. So if you like if you the thing is that that's just from our panel, and right. so like petroleum engineers maybe not maybe it's actually it would be a fun trial. Let's see if we can get them. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, thank you again for the presentation. Um, I'm not sure if it's on. Hello? Oh, all right, hold it. Put the switch. Put the switch up. Uh, so in the spirit of getting feedback as early as possible, which yeah. I completely agree with, what would you recommend for very early stage companies who, oh, yeah. you know, you are at this, you've sketched it out, something that maybe is, you know, do you recommend just bringing your sketches and going sitting with your user segment and, you know, showing them paper or I, I don't know yeah. what the pricing is, but, you know, what are your thoughts on just kind of even getting it pre- you know anything like yes. is this how yeah. does this fit besides in? the general you know needs analysis and discussion and voice of customer stuff but uh, that that like kind of that in between stage yeah um we actually would like love to work more with companies at that stage and like totally acknowledge that like a big enterprise plan when you're doing like one thing is like not sort of the model um and so yeah we like we work with companies that just have an idea so far and so yeah any sketch like anything that sort of shows what it is that you're trying to offer to make sure that people get that like is it clear what you're trying to offer and what the benefit of that is like can they in their own words describe why this is going to help them do what they do i mean that can be a static image you can sort of mock up like the first four screens that someone might go to and see if they can get there and then also if like each step still makes sense and is um like is what they expect to see and then ask questions like what do you expect to see if you click this and then like what is trying to build their mental model so sort of anything that allows you to build their mental model of this thing yeah talk about just starting the search engine too and asking what they currently maybe do this all the time oh maybe you should so <laughs> by the way i also work at user testing uh, so another thing too is if you don't even have sketches you can also start people just in a search engine so you might want to ask them about i always use the problem of like uh, you know, how do you figure out when you get to work? So you might think of traffic and whatever your commute is. And if you're trying to kind of validate if there's a problem there, you might already ask people what they do to try to solve it. So you may learn that they really hate X about this app, or unfortunately there's no problem to solve. Probably not the case, but you might just want to learn about what people really like about others in the space. And you might decide to be really divergent from that because it's not your specialty that you want to focus on, it's already saturated. So um, you can think of user testing as remote interviews where you're not even there. And I'll just ask people, like, what do you do? Tell me about it. And that's so open-ended that you're just going to get a lot of rich data all over the place, but it's probably going to be so informative that it helps you come up with better questions to follow up with. Cool, thanks. I'll let Jared do the answer on the phone. <laughs> Try that again. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm curious about just the last thing Jared was saying. Um, so you can actually through this do sort of actual interviews rather than having them go through an experience, just an interview of the end, the end you know, user and, and have them you know face the camera and explain. Yeah, and you can do that unmoderated or moderated. I mean, most of what user test unless you use unmoderated, especially if you're like um, if you don't have sort of our professional services option. Um, but we, we offer moderated testing as well, where it really can be that one-on-one -on -one sort of interview, but you can ask, it's kind of like a sort of a, a mesh between the interview and a survey. It's like asking people questions, but it allows you to get richer data than just a written response. So you can actually see them show you, or maybe it's like an interview and a survey and a focus group kind of meshed together, where it's like they can show you what they would do now. You can ask them questions about sort of like, I don't know, describe a typical day in the life of you at your work. And a, a weird question. Yeah. I, not that I don't want to use user testing, yeah. but I'm curious if there's situations where you don't see this, the types of products being developed where this actually cannot assist. Part of this is, for yeah. example, I work in a product that I'm like three degrees removed from an end user, don't control the end user experience, and the product will ship in 12 months. <laughs> okay. Um, and so what, do you do any usability testing? Uh, we produce some software that fits into the fingerprint sensor on the phones. Okay, okay. But <laughs> yeah. ultimately it ends up being something that enables user experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I wonder if, I don't know if you know if the people integrating that like system are doing any testing, like even sort of like the systems engineers are doing testing on the overall experience, like does that work? 
But the end, the end customer would be like a banking user. Yeah. So it would be the bank that would build the user interface that yeah. would use the fingerprint that's manufactured by someone else that goes yeah. into someone else's phone. I know, and that's so frustrating because if they find issues, like in this, I've, I've been in situations where like I'll do testing and then find issues, especially at the Nielsen Norman Group, I did a lot of research into intranets, and it's like, it's, I mean, an intranet is usually like a whole bunch of different third-party apps like put together. And so we would do usability testing, and then like one of the things that didn't work was one of these third-party apps, and they would just be like, well, nothing we can do about that. And it's like at some point, it's a big enough issue that really you should do something about it and maybe look into another solution. Like if this is breaking the experience for someone, um, I would probably put the burden, I mean, this it's worth like sort of you guys doing testing, but in some ways the burden is on the people producing that like end user experience to do testing of all their integrations and making sure it works all in one. Um, but yeah, like super specialized audiences maybe something, and just the like really really highly sensitive information is just not great for unmoderated remote testing. Like if you you want to control who sees what you have, and you don't want people to see it yet, um, you don't want to get you don't want people to have that like. Like if we can test um, like unreleased apps, and so if you don't want someone to have an unreleased app on their phone, then that's probably not the best method. Hi, um, my question was: uh, in our products, we kind of do a lot of data visualization yeah. for our customers. So how does user testing fall into place the data visualization, and what what are your best practices or suggestions? Um, so is your concern that people wouldn't understand what they're looking at when yeah. you're testing a yeah. concept? I mean, if you're coming up with new data sets, and you're trying to present it to the new to the users in a different way. Yeah. How do we make sure that our presentation really makes sense? Yeah. And it's intuitive for all kinds of users who are using the dashboards. Um, I've done something similar. I don't know if it was like equally like intense data visualization, but where like the data. Like if you're testing a prototype, you kind of have to pre-populate it with data, and so it becomes really important to set people up so that they know the steps that got them to that final stage, which is even why in the situation that I was testing, I walked people through every step of the process from logging in to seeing the dashboard to creating a test so that they knew what they had done to get there, and then it ends up actually being okay that it's not their data because they like followed along the steps, and so if you walk someone through so if it's not the final thing that they can input their data, you walk someone through all the steps that got them to that screen, you can then ask them to explain, I would just have them explain in their own words what the different graphs mean. Like, it's a great way, like what, what, what conclusions can you draw from this? What does this mean to you? Yeah, let's do one more. You can come ask me after. <laughs> Yeah, I like the fact that you actually have them talking through their soft puzzle while performing the task. But do you provide a heat map of where their eyes are landing on the page? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> that would be nice. We'd have to do that through the webcam probably. And that technology just isn't that great yet. People are trying it. Um, once that's perfected and once it's easier to do eye tracking, like we definitely, we're sort of on the lookout for like what's happening in the eye tracking world. It doesn't happen yet. I have found, having done a lot of eye tracking research, that um, eye tracking is eye tracking now requires a lot more participants to make sure you can get the heat map. So the heat map is like a statistical model of where people looked. And so what you could do with like three people to get some quick insights into like why something worked or didn't for them, all of a sudden now you need a lot more participants. So it's adding like overhead to that. And then the conclusions you can draw from it are sort of like, okay, they looked there, they didn't look there, you still don't know the why, and then you still need to hear the qualitative. Um, and so I don't, I like eye tracking for some things. I don't think it's the like best solution for like people on a product, like on a product team designing a product, it's not gonna get you the answers that you need as quickly as you probably want them. Okay, thanks yeah, guys. Guys, was that an awesome talk or what? That was, I thought that was very informative. That was great. Um, a lot of specific examples, uh, specific tools. That's what our, you know, play, our, we try not to be conceptual and theoretical. We try to give people specific tools. Thanks so much for doing that example. That was so cool. She's an example and showed you how to iterate. Um, that was great. Okay, so just a little bit to wrap up here. A couple things real quick, and then we still have some food and drinks left, so hang out. Um, we practice what we preach here as far as agile and customer feedback, so please. Uh, if you have any feedback on uh, what you liked, what could be better, um, come talk to me. 
An important part of Meetup is leaving ratings and reviews on the Meetup site. So if it's your first time here, if you've never left a rating or review, or, or even if you have, it, you can rate each individual event. So please go in. That helps us um, you know, get feedback and lets other people see what a good community of Meetup we've built here. So if you could do that, that'd be great on the Meetup.